Hello and welcome everybody to this Global Fleet Champions webinar on incident reporting and investigation. If you are new to our webinars, Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Break the Road Safety Charity to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. To learn more about the work that we do and to access more of our resources and events, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. Our webinar today looks at incident reporting and investigation. Comprehensive incident reporting and investigation procedures are a key element of any fleet strategy to manage work-related road risk. Failing to investigate a crash involving one of your drivers could not only harm your reputation, but it also means you miss the chance to learn from the incident and introduce measures to help prevent future crashes. Responsible fleets have thorough practice procedures in place to investigate any crash involving their drivers and use the learning to improve the safety of their journeys. In this webinar, you will learn why thorough investigations are essential to understand why crashes occur and prevent future crashes, how to conduct an effective post-incident investigation, and how to create your own procedure to report and investigate incidents. In a moment, a multiple choice question poll will appear on your screen so we can find out your views on this topic. It is anonymous. Simply select one answer and press submit, and we will discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which will take place at the end of today's presentations. You can put forward your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on the webinar panel. The poll question will appear on your screen shortly, and the webinar will then begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome and um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Frances Senior. I am the head of the Forensic Collision Investigation Network, a network of um, 43 police forces working collaboratively to improve the um, forensic collision investigation at serious and fatal road traffic collisions. And I just want to take a few moments today to talk to you about um, why reporting and um, investigations are essential in your in your working areas. So um, just very briefly, we're in a process of massive change ourselves in, in policing collision investigation, and we are going through um, the difficult process of turning our collision investigators from white hats, as they traditionally wore in policing, um, as being police traffic officers, into scientists. Um, there's, they may still be police officers, they may be police staff, but the work that they are doing is becoming much more scientific in basis. And that is all about knowing the root causes of what happens, really understanding the science that they're delivering and um, improving standards across the board. So what are the values to yourselves of uh, investigation of um, near miss incidents? Well, um, I don't need to read these points off the slides to you. However, um, the value of investigation, whether it's a near miss, a minor incident or something um, far more serious, are pretty standard in that by understanding the consequences um, of any incidents involving one of your vehicles, you can learn from that and you can improve the quality of your fleet, you can improve the um, efficiency of your business and most importantly, you can improve the safety of your drivers, your colleagues and road users and the public. So, you know, it's a critical area of business and one that I would encourage you all to really actively engage in. However, as the second bullet point says, um, many near miss incidents, whether they're involving vehicles or as we go about our day to day work are often overlooked because none of us get injured and we just go about our day to day business um, quite blindly in many cases. But there is a fine line between something that could end up in a, um, in a minor incident and what could end up in something much more significant. And it's really understanding the factors that contribute to either of those outcomes that will make the difference to yourselves and your businesses. So I would encourage all um, fleet managers and those involved in this line of work to really understand and implement a robust near miss reporting structure. Have those policies and procedures in place because they will provide you with the most valuable insight into potential problem areas within your operations. It will also give you great insight into how you can improve your service delivery and how you can improve the safety of everybody who works with you, for you, or uses your services out there in the public. Thorough incident reporting can also highlight those less obvious hazards 
And for those kind of areas, I would be thinking about the human factors and what, um, what impacts your driver's ability to discharge their work safely and to um, minimise risk to all involved. So a really, really valuable area um, is to implement an investigation process and one that all your um, team can buy into. Like I briefly said earlier, root cause analysis is what this should all be about. It's about understanding, if you look at those two pictures on the slide, that could be, obviously it isn't, but it could be the same vehicle in both of those slides going about a day's work. What is the difference? What happened to make the, um, the journey carried out by the bottom left vehicle? What happened to make it have a, an RTC? Is it something that's on the road? Is it something that's gone uh, defective with the vehicle? Is it some of the road engineering issues? Or is it driver behavior? So until you carry out your investigation and until you have that robust policy and procedure in place that everybody buys into for the wider benefits, you might really struggle to understand the root cause analysis. And without that root cause analysis and understanding what those key factors are, you may never really get to the bottom of how you can prevent it in the future and stop further incidents from occurring. So I would say that whilst ever you go about this area of work, keep in mind that this isn't about blame, this is about understanding what happened in order to prevent it in the future and make it safer for everybody. So the benefits of no misreporting, um, obviously it enables you to be proactive and prevent something tragic or costly or um, just difficult from occurring in the future. And business disruption is part of that, obviously. It engages um, the workforce at all levels in contributing to the problem solving. So there is nothing more empowering to staff than being um, able to participate and contribute to the solutions. So by enabling them to have a mechanism to report near misses and for them to understand what happened and how to prevent it in future, will really get that buy-in at your staff level and enable everybody to feel that they're part of the solution rather than just causing the problem. I've seen it in my own area of work. It is a hugely empowering uh, position to be in when everybody feels that they are contributing to the greater good. Obviously, it will increase your... Um, ownership of safety strategies and um, the outcome of that will be your workers self-esteem goes up their level of confidence that their employers are taking them seriously and doing the best that they can to make sure it's a safe environment for all concerned will reap some um, non-tangible rewards and probably improve, improve their productivity and satisfaction so that can't be underestimated it will unveil information that you might not have otherwise been aware of and some really key things that you probably were blind to before you may um, uncover that will be hugely beneficial to your future business models and um, operational delivery and really it's about culturing that um, that strategy and um, ownership amongst all of your teams and employees that safety is something that everybody is contributing towards positively so there's many benefits to you as an employer I would encourage you all to, um, to learn lessons from other industries really, and um, my experiences to date show that people can sometimes be fearful of reporting incidents, um, whether it's near misses, whether it's a quality failure, whether it's missing a deadline. People sometimes come from a position of fear that in, um, in raising an issue, recording it and asking for it to be investigated, it will reflect negatively on them. But lessons from all the other um, accident investigation fields such as maritime rail and aviation foster a no blame culture and I think that's really critical if you want to get the best out of people and you want them to be open and frank and highlight what the issues were on that given day or what was going through their minds when they took a turn that um, led to a near miss or they had an engineering defect that they thought would go away whatever the root cause is if you foster that no blame culture, they will be much more likely to participate fully and frankly and give you all the facts that you need to have in order to get to that root cause analysis and put your preventative strategies in place. There is a lot to be said for human factors work as well. So if you haven't really got any specialism in the human factors behind um, driving and driving safely, then I would encourage you all to, to reach out to other industries and try and learn from the lessons that they've had. 
there are lots of resources out there on human factors and training courses available so that might be a, a useful resource for you but i can't um, i can't encourage you enough really in the benefits of adopting some kind of policy educating your staff and having a no blame culture i think those three are the um, the foundations of making your workplace making your fleet more productive more efficient and safer for everybody in the business your customers and the wider community so i hope that um, really brief um, run through has been useful and i hope that you all have safe journeys and um, your fleets operate safely in the future so thank you very much for your time Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Drury. Uh, I am a global fleet champion. I'm proud to be so. Uh, I have been for, involved with Break for the last six or seven years. Uh, a little, and I'm really looking forward to dealing with this uh, second presentation for you this afternoon on post incident procedure. Uh, a little bit of background about myself so you can understand my expertise in this area. I've been a collision investigator for 20 years now. Uh, during that time, I've dealt with or being involved with, with nearly 40,000 collisions uh, and investigations on near misses as well. So I've gained quite a considerable amount of expertise and experience uh, and I've used the information I've gained from there to start analysing issues over why incidents happen, hence why I've been asked to help with this presentation this afternoon. And in the last five or six years I've moved into road safety from the issues I've learned during investigations and hopefully I'll be able to uh, Give you some information that I've gleaned to help you with your processes going forward. So, post incident um, procedures, uh, it's a vitally important process for, for any fleet operation, and it's a procedure that needs to be followed by all managers and staff in the event of a near miss uh, or collision or crash, um, and should describe everything that's happened as what's gone on throughout the process of the collision probably before and after as well and how you look at lessons that uh, you've learned and implementations and remedial actions that you need to consider going forward uh, and also roles and responsibilities we will cover uh, in this brief session this afternoon so post incident procedures and we move on to the first slides the stress test that's what happens um, when we have an incident. Your policies and procedures are put under stress to make sure that they work properly. So your post-incident procedure, what are your current policies and processes? And they'll be asked certain questions as follows. Did they work as expected? We all write them, we all think uh, it will work in our head, but when it actually comes to happening, do they work as we expected them to work? If they don't, uh, we'll also ask uh, what has worked well, uh, as well as asking what didn't work well. And both of these are as important as each other, because at least we can, from working well, we've proactively recognised certain things and it's, it's happened the way we expected it. Those things that didn't work well are areas that we need to look at improving or we didn't expect to happen the way they did on the day. What had we missed? Uh, I think when a policy is put under a stress test the first time, some things will clearly be missed. And you'll think, I've never thought of that at the time of writing the policy. But once you've gone through the process, think about what you've missed and make sure that you can implement these things going forward. And what can you do better? Some things may have worked well, but can still be done better. Some things that didn't work well can obviously be done better. So it's a sort of a five step process for the stress test uh, at this time. So regardless of the instance, your post instant procedure should always be the same. Uh, regardless of how minor or serious the actual incident is. Really doesn't make any difference. The same processes should be in place and each incident should be followed through in the same format. Regardless of whether it's a fault or not fault so it could involve a third party it could just be own damage to your own vehicle on a depot or reversing on and off the driveway in a company car the process should be looked at in the same way where it involves injury or no injury again really makes no difference because claims we know can be made up to three years post collision uh, 
and unexpectedly made without any sort of pre-warning. So make sure we follow the processes properly throughout. And whether a claim is made or not, as we just said, it really makes no difference. Get the information in advance and be forewarned as forearmed in case the claim is made. So plan of action. Here we have one square and we'll soon start adding to these squares uh, on this little flow chart. This is probably the most single, most important person in the whole process is the person within your organization who is the collision or instant manager. Could be a collision champion, or however you want to title it within your organization. They need to be the focal point and the person of main responsibility throughout the process. So within your group, they will deal with these six potential uh, partners and colleagues. And I think the main issue is, is that they, your instant manager controls the process and controls the communication with these people. More so, the transport manager will have immediate contact with the company driver, but everybody on there will have their roles and responsibilities. And also the driver's family, uh, your incident manager needs to have contact with them, depending on the severity of the incident involved, um, just to keep things the communication process going. Everybody from there will report back through to the incident manager, just so they can collate all the information, look at it objectively, and stand aside from the process that has been undertaken by their colleagues. So that's the internal process. Externally, they will have exposure to the enforcement authorities and the emergency services. So we have the police, fire, ambulance, vehicle recovery agents involved in the process, if need be. Then further along, health and safety, traffic commissioner, DVSA, maybe the environmental agency, depending on what the incident is. And then at the bottom, as we go through maybe legal proceedings, we've got issues uh, of the five areas that the incident manager will be involved in and need to know what's happening at all times. As you can see right at the bottom, the one area that the incident manager will not have any contact with is the press, if the incident is serious enough. And that should always be left to the company solicitor. So everybody here knows what their roles and responsibilities are. And also everybody knows how everything is fed back to the incident manager. So we don't want the insurance company going to the transport manager over the information or the compliance manager. Let it all come through the one central point of contact. Keep it simple. Responsibilities, policies, processes are key. So we all start with communication and training. Make sure everybody understands what uh, they need to be doing. Make sure it's clearly communicated and everybody is trained to undertake their responsibilities for when it is called upon. Immediate reporting from the scene when possible. Again, for drivers, immediate training for drivers when they start as part of an induction. If they're involved in an incident, make sure they contact the company from the scene where possible if the police or they've not been injured too seriously. Every incident is a new investigation. It doesn't matter whether you've had 10 incidents similar, should go into an investigation with any preconceived ideas of how it may have happened because every driver, every incident, every scenario is slightly different. So go in with a fresh pair of eyes at all times. Set your parameters on whether you just need to undertake desktop or a physical investigation. The severity of the, invest of the collision may determine that. The cost of the collision may determine that. Definitely a catastrophic incident will, and fatal incident would have a physical investigation. But set your parameters so you have the right processes in place to determine the things quickly and, up and, and promptly. Have objective analysis. Keep conflict out of the process. I would suggest if you have multi depots, have one transport manager or one incident manager at one depot take control of issues at another depot in case there's conflict with staff. Just think about what things could come up that could cloud the process of the investigation and the analysis process. Once everything is, is over and done with, um, look at your incident report that you've compiled of what's gone well, what's not gone well, what has been the learnings. And look at these things for your remedial actions based on facts, because that's what you'll have. You'll 
have the facts following a full investigation procedure, so you can base your remedial actions on quantifiable evidence. Implement recommendations. Some can be immediate, some can be phased in over a period of time. Depending what, what your organisation setup is, depending on cost, it will always come into it, and, and time management. But think about how you want to bring the, the implementation process through the, through the stages as time goes on. Update policies and processes once you looked at everything else and you can see where you need to make improvements to the written documentation that everybody sees uh, on an ongoing process. And then once you've done that, make sure you go back to the beginning. It's all about communication and retraining of the updated policies and processes thereafter. So this has been a very short, sharp um, presentation on the post-incident um, process procedure. And I'd just like to thank you for your time. Hope it's been helpful. And if you've got any questions, I'll answer them at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alex Livideus, and I'm a consultant from the Transport Research Laboratory in Berkshire in the UK. I'm going to present some information that may be helpful to you in investigating a traffic collision, focusing on investigative techniques and how to collect evidence. Investigating a crash can be complex and in some circumstances may best be done by a trained professional. However, even in a complex case, information that is gathered by someone with an appreciation of what to look for and how to record what they find correctly and accurately may be invaluable to an investigation, even if it takes place a long time afterwards. Today, I'll give you some practical tips on how to be prepared to investigate, what to look for at the scene of an incident or on a vehicle and how to record what you find. I'll move through the presentation quite quickly today, but it will be available to download and there will be opportunities to submit questions later. I'll start by briefly looking at contributory factors to crashes because understanding what these factors can be helps you to know what to look for when investigating. So in order for a crash or, or a collision to happen, a number of factors may be involved and these factors can be broken down into three categories, human, environmental and vehicle. Environmental factors might be the weather or the road surface. Vehicle factors might be a mechanical fault. Human factors may include distraction, fatigue, or being in a hurry, to give just a few examples. And it may be that several factors have come together at just the wrong time. So for example, a driver who is tired, has to brake suddenly to avoid a collision, may not crash on a day when the road is dry, but may skid into the car in front when it's wet. So a crash is not an accident that happens purely by chance, and this means that they are preventable. A part of the prevention is understanding what happens and why, and that's one of the reasons we investigate. This graph represents data collected by the police and published by the UK government. It shows a number of contributory factors to crashes as determined by the police and also the severity of those crashes. Clearly, vehicle defects marked with a V make up a very small proportion of the total, and already we're getting clues as to where we should concentrate our efforts when investigating crashes. The E's, V's and H's on the graph indicate whether environmental, vehicle or human factors were involved. As we can see, there are a lot of H's and we can also see that driver error or reaction is by far the highest column. So now we come on to ways of actually investigating a crash. Although an investigation can be complex, a simple one can be done with some basic training and useful evidence can be gathered. So in order to start investigating, you will need some simple equipment, which I'll talk about later in more detail. You'll need an idea of what evidence you might look for, and you will need to know where you might find it. As well as physical evidence, there might be recordings on dash cams, on tachographs and on CCTV. There may be witness accounts, also background evidence such as vehicle logbooks and other records should not be overlooked. As every detective knows, the time immediately following an incident is when most evidence is likely to be found, and this is sometimes referred to as the golden hour. As time passes, evidence tends to disappear, so it helps to start your investigation as soon as possible. Despite the fact that your driver will be at the scene of a collision, I suggest that your expectations of what they should do there are limited. I'm only going to mention what they might be able to do to help determine the causes of a crash and not any legal responsibilities they may have or actions they should take in relation to health and safety. A collision of any severity is likely to be traumatic for those involved, so I don't believe it's reasonable or practical to expect them to do much investigation. 
Also, a driver involved in a crash can't be regarded as impartial, so they should be regarded as a witness to the events and not be expected to investigate. They may, though, be able to record useful information at the scene. Your insurance company may provide you with a pro forma collision report form, and this is a good starting point for a driver. And the next best thing they can do is take a lot of photographs, then to write an account of what happened as soon as possible. So moving on to some practicalities. Knowing what you may need to do at a collision scene and being prepared for what you might find could save you a wasted trip. And it may also mean that you don't miss or lose evidence. It might seem obvious, but you do need to know exactly where a collision happened before you go and have a look. If the vehicles and the people involved are no longer there, it might be hard to work out directions of travel, which way somebody turned or even which junction they were at. You're wasting your time if you go to the wrong place and you should get as much information as possible beforehand to allow you to pinpoint the location, directions of travel and so on. If you can get someone who is there to mark up a map for you or get them to come with you, try to go at a time that will make the inspection easier and safer. There may be less traffic at certain times of day. Consider also whether you should go at all. You would not be taking measurements on this road, for example, but you might photograph it from a bridge. It's worth drawing up a risk assessment that you use before and at each, at each site visit so that you have an aid memoir of things to consider. What type of road it is, what will the traffic be like, what's the weather like, and so on. You only need basic equipment for a scene visit, and I've made some suggestions here, but you should certainly take a camera. You don't need to be an expert photographer, but try to take images that reproduce what you see in front of you without any special effects. You could consider some training in how to use your camera in order to, to get the best out of it and also to help you to take photos which are good representations of what's actually there. The easiest way to take measurements over the distances that may be involved is with a measuring wheel and having a crayon or chalk to make marks on the road or cones to show positions in photographs is useful. Examining vehicles in detail is more specialised, but that does not stop anyone from taking photographs of them. I cannot emphasise enough there are risks associated with both road inspections and vehicle inspections, and you should always assess these risks when deciding what to do and how to do it. PPE can help, but it does not make you invulnerable, and I suggest that specific training should be considered for anyone who is going to visit collision scenes. Having an idea of what you might be looking for when you arrive at a crash scene will help you um, prevent you, uh, you overlooking something and it might help having an idea of what you may be looking for when you arrive at a crash scene will help prevent you overlooking something and it might help you to design some pro forma paperwork or even just a tick list that will jog your memory some of this information may be available from your own driver or their dash cam tachograph or telematics data each case will be different though and it may be by the time you arrive all that you see is an empty road other times there may be more to look for and this list includes some of those things. When you arrive, make sure you're at the right place and consider carefully where you will stop, if at all. You might have to park a little way off and walk back or it might not be safe or legal to stop anywhere nearby. So, of course, you should not if that is the case. And there's no shame in going back to the office and saying it was too risky to stop because nobody wants you to become an additional casualty. If the crash was serious enough for the police to have been to it, they may have left evidence of their examination. For example, the paint marks in this photo, which highlight the position and direction of gouges made in the road surface. Don't worry too much if you see marks and don't know what they mean, because um, it might help later if you record them. Take a lot of photos and make measurements where you can. And as well as taking photos, consider making a sketch, and I'll talk more about this later. If the scene is still relatively fresh, then you may find, thing, find things like this. Skid marks, which aren't so common now with anti-lock braking systems. Fluid leaks, which can show where vehicles collided and where they came to rest. Gouges in the road made by parts of the vehicles that contacted it. Um, evidence of where curbs were hit by tyres um, or wheels. And marks on verges where vehicles have run off the road. Evidence like this is usually cleared away or fades quickly, so the sooner you can go to a scene, the more likely you are to find it. However, it's possible you will go to a crash scene long after everything has been cleared away and there will be nothing much left to see. I do believe, though, it's likely that you will learn something by going to a collision scene as it can give you a better understanding of what happened. Your scene sketch does not have to be a work of art, but even a little information can prove to be useful later. 
This example here shows a small number of measurements that might help in this case, for example, in assessing what the visibility was like from this junction. Reducing a drawing like this might just take a few minutes, but it could make a big difference in assessing what happened. When taking measurements, it's good practice to work from features that are not likely to change, such as curbs or lampposts. If you can't get to the location, then you may be able to get dimensions from online mapping tools, but these may not be as accurate as your own measurements. Photographs will be invaluable to any investigation, and I suggest that you take lots of them. It's better than not taking enough. If you take photographs in sequences as you walk around scenes, then it helps you to work out what they are later, for example, on the approach to this junction. Taking notes of what you've photographed may help too when it comes to putting it all together into a report at a later date. Before you set off for a scene, check that your camera battery is charged and that you have a memory card with enough capacity. And before you leave, do check on your camera that you've actually got the photos that you expected, which may save you having to go back. This shows uh, another sequence of photographs on the approach to a collision scene and shows a driver's eye view from the road, which may be quite different from the view you have from the pavement. The height of the viewpoint may also be important, so you could consider taking photos from a tripod with the camera set to the driver's eye height. As ever, you must be very aware of your own safety and that of other road users. If I photograph a sequence like this, I walk away from my reference point, measuring the intervals of the wheel as I go. I mark the distances on the road with chalk at each point and then walk back taking the photographs as I go. The first photo I take at each point is the distance I've written on the road so I can tell later which photo is which. It can also be useful to make a dash cam video from which you can take stills but it may be harder to assess distances. Turning now to vehicles, the first thing to do usually is to take a set of photos from all around the vehicle with it filling the frame of each photo. Taking photos which show that a part of a vehicle was not damaged may be just as important as showing the damage, so try to record all of it. It's a common mistake when photographing vehicles to concentrate on the damaged areas and just to take close-up shots, in which case it can be hard to tell where these are and what you're looking at. It's hard to see what we're looking at here in this photo unless the damage is also shown in context. So if you're going to take close-up shots of damage, then start with a view that shows where it is and then go closer in. And again, a sequence or even a video might help. If a vehicle needs a mechanical inspection, then this should be done by someone who is trained because it could be dangerous. After you've made your examinations and collected all of your available information, you need to decide what to do with it and you may need to produce some kind of report. If you're a fleet manager, you may already have a reporting system and a format to use, but I've suggested some things to consider when writing your report with the overarching principle that your conclusions should be based on facts. It may be that you don't have enough information and you are not able to draw any firm conclusions, and that can be a perfectly valid outcome. You should not expect to always be able to conclusively work out what happened. So, as I hope I've shown, there are some simple steps that can be taken to document and understand what happened in a crash, and what you might do might be invaluable in providing information that could otherwise be lost forever. Having a predefined process to follow can help you to investigate as a fleet manager or can provide information to an insurer, for example, or to an expert who may then be able to reconstruct a collision in some detail. This may help you to learn from the incident and put measures in place to stop it happening again. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Mike Colburn. I'm the Health and Safety Advisor for Supply Chain Logistics for Tarmac, Cement and Lime. I've been asked to go through this part of the webinar for learning lessons around accident investigation. Now, the background is things will happen which are outside of our control. This is a fact that all transport operations have to live with. Once a vehicle is started up and starts moving, your level of control diminishes. You can only control what you can control. Drivers, once they leave your gate and go out, they are completely outside your control. You just have to hope that your training and their common sense overrides everything else that may happen around them. When things do go wrong, you need to investigate the incident and take any learnings that come out of your investigation. Because if you don't take learnings, the same things will happen again and again, and it will have a negative effect on your business. You need to be thorough and don't be afraid to ask the awkward questions 
or what may seem to be stupid questions. You'd be surprised how much you learn from these because you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes asking the most stupid question will get the answers to, to questions you hadn't even thought about. Try to understand everything you can from whatever you have available. Use the solid evidence you have to build up a picture of the events leading up to the incident. Try not to make assumptions because these will destroy the investigation and the learnings. Because if you have preconceived ideas as to what happened, then you're already on the back foot. You've decided in advance what is the uh, outcome of the accident. So I'm gonna run a video, and this is an incident that happened back in 2016. This is a 26 ton rigid vehicle on the 470 near Pontypridd in South Wales. Um, it's quite clear what happens, but let's run through it anyway. Now, as you can see from that footage, that driver had plenty of time to stop in time. He even speeded up to try and beat the light and even seeing the vehicle coming, he made no attempt to slow down or stop whatsoever or even avoid the incident. Totally and wholly unacceptable. So doing the investigation, we have to take the first steps. Have a template ready that directs the investigator to follow process with details what's wanted and required to complete an investigation. This should be prepared well, well, well in advance and agreed and used many times to test it for ruggedness. Check how the drivers and, and others at the incident are. Remember, he's still your driver if he's been involved in an incident, even if he's at fault. He's representing you and your company. Do not treat the driver in a, in a poor way as you'll lose their cooperation. They won't help. And you'll never learn anything. Their input into your investigation will be to give you the greatest insights as to what happens. You need to understand what they were thinking and doing at the time. Where it is safe to do so, gather all the evidence that will or could disappear. Some of this may need to be done by the person involved in the incident. Now, this is a judgment call for you at the time, whether the person is fit to be able to carry out the, the tasks required. It's a judgment call you need to make potentially over the phone with the driver if you can't get there yourself. If you feel they're in shock or not communicating as they should do, these are things you may not even want to ask. They may need medical attention. You just don't know how people react post collision. So this includes at the scene evidence, details of all the vehicles involved, get photos and as much notes as the, as the person involved can take. The position of all the vehicles, including any potential eyewitness vehicles, because eyewitness vehicles will disappear like you wouldn't believe. Names and contact details for everyone involved and any of the witnesses. And the names, shoulder number and station of any police officers who attend the scene. The next steps post collision is ensure your driver is looked after, go and collect him, make sure he's taken home. You then follow any policies you may have. Some companies suspend their drivers following an incident irrespective of liability or severity. So even if this driver hadn't been at fault, the company I was working for at the time would have suspended the driver to look after him. And he would have been treated the same whether he was at fault or not. So that way then you can guarantee a level of support and cooperation from the drivers. They feel they've been, everyone's been dealt with in exactly the same way. Obtain all the electronic evidence as quickly as possible. This includes dash cam footage if you have it tachograph speed traces because if you're trying to get a direct speed trace to compare to your dash cam footage you need to be within 24 hours downloading the tackle head to get the proper speed trace because it diminishes in what evidence it will give you over a period of time telematics use it to its fullest advantage get whatever you can from it for this harsh braking harsh cornering look back and see what the driver was doing previously is there any pattern of behavior where possible, get someone who has no control over the driver or stakeholding in the outcome to interview the driver when they're ready to be interviewed. Sometimes the last thing a driver wants is his line manager or his planner or his transport manager, whoever it may be, to be the one to interview him because he may feel he's let them down. 
also as well there may be some conflict of interest within it and this is where we try not to make the assumptions as well gather all supplementary evidence so get police reports damage reports from your repairs your costings everything else even you need an overall report and you also need an overall understanding of what the true cost if it's your liability what it really is to you what is the how is this going to affect your potential bottom line so when you get into the detailed report you must build it off the evidence you have and include it all don't leave anything out include what i believe to be the underlying contributory factors if, if you've got it you may potentially have something built in the background where you have tables that you can pull from that will help the investigator to have a list of what could be underlying attributive factors to help them through this process. Include an action plan to include immediate, medium and long-term actions. Include a list of recommendations detailing who is responsible for these with realistic timeframes attached. Sometimes we take knee-jerk reactions and trying to get everything done straight away. You can't. Sometimes it's best just to stop, take a breath, let the world turn a little bit and understand what you can and can't achieve. Ensure all interested parties receive a copy of the, this report. This includes line manager, fleet manager, HR, and especially the responsible director. Because if the company is brought, name is brought into disrepute, whether it could go to uh, the traffic commissioner for driver conduct or whatever it may be, public safety, if it's in the press, then the directors need to know. It's their company, they're responsible for it. Carry out a review after an agreed period of time to ensure all actions have been closed out and recommendations followed. What we do in Tarmac Cement in Lyme is we normally have a three month window where we give time for the um, immediate and medium term actions to be closed out and get an understanding of where we are with long term actions as well. And potentially we would take it to a senior incident review as well. So any directors involved would be involved in this process as well. Share your learnings with everyone who may be affected by them. There's no point knowing what the learnings are if you don't share them and everybody who can can learn from them and input these measures to stop the reoccurrence of this action happening. So that, that's the end of that. But if I give you a quick outline as to what happened with the driver, he, he was at fault at the time. They, he was uh, sent to the traffic commissioner for a conduct hearing. He lost his vocational license for a period of time. He also lost his driving license in court for careless and reckless driving. And he was dismissed from the company. But that was following a robust investigation where we knew we were totally covered off as a company. Thank you for your time. A big thank you to our speakers, uh, especially to Andrew Drury and Francis Senior, who join us now for the live question and answer session. Before we head on to taking um, answers to your questions, we will discuss the results of today's poll. As you can see, we asked whether your organisation reports all near miss incidents involving your vehicles. 38% of attendees answered yes. 46% answered no and 17 percent said they don't know uh, we've got joined here by andrew and francis are these results surprising to you um or are they roughly in line with what you'd expect in terms of near miss incident reporting um, i don't think they're a surprise to me i think they're probably in keeping with wider incident reporting across most organizations it depends how well embedded the culture of incident reporting is. So um, no surprise to me, really. Uh, Adam, I think I'd say I'm I am a little bit surprised that so many people report, uh, investigate near misses. I would have expected that figure to be a little bit lower. Um, but it's encouraging to know that the, the, the delegates today do take this part of the, investigate, the incident investigation process serious. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, moving on then to our uh, question and answer sessions. Uh, Francis, we have a question here for you. Um, you discussed briefly 
and the creation of a no blame culture in incident reporting. Do you have any advice on how organizations can start implementing that? Um, I think um, there's various ways that you can implement it. You can, um, it's about communication effectively. So um, I think as long as you can build a culture of confidence with employees and your drivers in your organization, to know that there will be no adverse um, impact on them and their, their job security, et cetera, for raising incidents, then you are much likely, uh, much more likely to foster that open communication with them. I think people in any um, organization with any incident reporting process can be fearful of any ramifications that might come their way from, from raising it. But in, in the organizations that I've worked in, it's always been about making it safer for employees. And you can't do that unless you understand the issues and get to the root cause of it. I think um, it's important to share lessons learned so if you do adopt a culture of no blame incident reporting, then share with your employees the outcomes of those reports and how they have led to, um, I don't know, improvements in cross training, equipment, fleet, etc. cetera. Um, they will then be able to see that actually they've contributed to making their own organization a safer place and the roads more, uh, more safe for other road users. And they will then, um, take that feeling of ownership and be more willing to to continue reporting as will other members of the organization so it's just about fostering fostering the positivity the benefits of doing so and um, removing fear that it may in some way be used against them i would say excellent thank you uh, andrew a question here for you um you discussed the benefits obviously having uh, post-incident procedures in any fleet organization, but how um, how aware do you believe that uh, most fleets are of the benefits of having effective post-incident procedures? Is this common knowledge or is it something that we can be doing more to highlight? Uh, I think similar to what, backing up what Francis said really, having the no blame sort of culture encourages people to do it. I think people it comes down to the communication I, I would suggest a lot of fleet offer, a lot of employees aren't aware of the reporting process uh, aren't aware of what they need to do immediately post incident so without having that process in place the benefits of, to the company are, are quite negligible I think you can only get the benefits from something if it works properly so it's it's in the company's interest to to ensure staff are aware of what is in the policy, what what is in the policies, um, what they need to report, and what I think more so why they need to report it. Uh, it's not just a case; it's an incident. Report it regardless. I think explain why different incidents need to be reported because we're all aware that we learn more from the near misses than we do from the actual incident because there are more near misses. So if we don't investigate them and report them, then we're missing out on a, a really, really big bank of data and evidence that can improve and drive safety forward. Are there any problems that you're aware that you're aware of around convincing managers that these um, post incident procedures are something that's necessary? I would suggest the biggest barrier for most managers is time uh, and the energy that they need to put into it. Um, if they don't see the benefits of it, then they won't promote it and they won't investigate it properly. So that is probably the biggest issue we have to we have to overcome is before training the the, the drivers it, it, to report it is explaining it to the managers why it's vitally important for them to to take this forward as well. Okay. Uh, questions that we have lined up for today. So I just want to say a big thank you again to our speakers for taking part in today's webinar, and especially to Andrew and Francis for helping us out with the live Q&A session. If you want to continue any of the conversations that we've been having today, um, you can do so on our Global Fleet Champions Twitter feed, on our LinkedIn page. I really hope you found this webinar informative and you can take home some lessons that we can all use to work towards our shared goal of safe and healthy mobility in fleets. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank the webinar you. will now conclude. Thank you.